if you have all those five areas, emotions, thoughts, physical, relational, and spiritual, that creates a template for a mentally healthy home. Welcome to the Strategic Families Podcast, where we challenge your family to be rooted in God's Word, energized with gospel-centered purpose, and activated on mission for His kingdom. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Strategic Families Podcast. Great to be back with you again. So my guest today is Dr. Danny Huerta of Focus on the Family. Dr. Huerta is just a pro and knows so much about how we can cultivate a mentally healthy home. I love his energy and his passion for seeing families thrive. And I mean, seriously, would you expect anything else from Focus on the Family? What a fantastic ministry that the Lord has used to bless so many families, including ours. Dr. Huerta has so many great things to share with us today about what good mental health can look like in our homes. And if you're like me, you could use some help with this topic because it can get pretty complicated sometimes. So let's lean into this one. Before we get started, if you haven't already, just a friendly reminder to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. All right, here's the show. Well, I am excited to have on the show today my guest, Dr. Danny Huerta of Focus on the Family. Dr. Huerta, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Graham, thanks for having me on the show. Super privileged to be invited and honored to be able to talk to you about this important topic. Awesome. Well, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So could you just introduce yourself to our listeners? Tell us about your family, your field of interest, and what you do for a living to focus on the family. Graham, I love it. I just got to do this with a bunch of teenagers at, at school as we talked about career. And it, it's fun to think about the journey that God has us on. And I've been invited to uh, first of all, be, be a husband now for 24 years and uh, going on 25 to my lovely wife, Heather. And, uh, and then I have two two kids, ages 18 and 16, a son that's the oldest and then a daughter. Love them very much. We love spending time being being active, being outdoors in God's creation and hanging out together. And uh, I've gotten to be a, a school social worker before I came to focus on the family. I was in the school system in an impoverished Title I school district, got to work with the most troubled teens and kids in that district and with the Latino families as well. So a lot of special education students. And then I got to serve for 11 years as a counselor on the Focus on the Family team and uh, have had a private practice for more than 20 years. And uh, so I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And now I'm vice president of parenting and youth at Focus on the Family and, and have gotten to uh, also, I get a doctorate in that process, and that was that was tough. <laughs> that was a, a rough ride, Graham. Man, in that, in this role, I get to speak into the most foundational relationship that a child has in their development, not only in in their their everyday development in, in the mental health area, but also in the spiritual health and how they that they grow up in, in what they believe about God, their interaction, relationship with God. I get to be a part of that and lead a team of 29 amazing professionals here Focus on the family. And that's the plugged in team, the clubhouse club junior teams. If you know about Adventures in Odyssey, we have a clubhouse magazine. That clubhouse magazine uh, comes within our department. We get to speak into the Adventures in Odyssey, that famous world. And, uh, and then uh, we, we get to lead... Uh, very neat programs like uh, Raising Highly Capable Kids. It's an outreach program uh, for impoverished communities coming alongside of single parents, parents that may have never been parented before, and then Alive to Thrive, which is a suicide prevention resource, train the trainer type of uh, resource. So someone can initiate conversations preventatively with, with teens. And then uh, every, you know, every day we're, we're creating new content for our website on the parenting site that's age and stage related. And we're hitting topics like sexuality, technology, entertainment, mental health, spiritual growth, and then just everyday parenting challenges, discipline challenges, the reality that there's a lot coming at families. And right now there's a true war for our children's minds and souls. Mm. And we need to be attentive as parents. We need to be in the game. We need to be in there. And uh, really seeing the invitation that we have as an honor and a privilege and not and inconvenience as we speak truths into our children's lives. So that's what I get to do. Um, I, I've gotten to coach uh, kids and gotten to be in a, a different setting with kids along the way around basketball 
And man, we learned so many life lessons in so many different places. Today, I talk, when I talked to these kids, Graham, talked about how different pieces in our lives before we even get into a career are threads and pieces that God begins to build to prepare us for what he has for us down the road. So let's be a part of that as parents mm. in that time when they're five, when they're seven, when they're eight, when they're 10, are they learning about humility? Are they learning how to listen? Are they learning how to have conversation? All those things are all key pieces to what uh, happens in the future. So there it is, Graham. Oh, I couldn't agree more. There's so much coming at families right now. We need to be attentive. We have to be intentional. We have to be strategic. I, I couldn't agree more. In the home, like in, in my kids are 12, 10, 8, and 4, and I have these conversations like what you just said, where it's like all these things that we want you to become as, a, as adults, they don't start when you're 18. They start right now when you're 5, learning humility, learning to love and respect others. Like We can do that in our homes and set them up for godliness. I love the ministry of Focus on the Family. As I shared with you earlier, my kids are just hopelessly obsessed with Adventures in Odyssey. What a fantastic ministry. But just overall, Focus on the Family has been such a blessing to so many families, including ours. So just from the top, thank you so much for what you do. It's just amazing. Thank you for helping shore up the family unit. I know you engage with so many families. You get a chance to talk to so many families. Could you give us a sense? You know, you mentioned that the family is... You know, there's so much coming at families lately. I, I wonder if you could give us a sense of the type of issues and problems that families bring up when they talk to you. What kind of things are they looking for help with? It's a lot. So main, some main categories, sexuality is a big one on uh, just right now, gender confusion and, and sexuality in general, with pornography being a big topic with families. Another one is panic disorder, anxiety. Those have gone through the roof, double, tripled in some places. If you look back 25 years, we've at least doubled as a, as a nation in the diagnosis of anxiety disorders. And then we have stress disorders. Depression has increased. Uh, the use of, of, of marijuana with the legalization and the impacts that that brings, along with alcohol. Alcohol is a huge, huge issue among uh, later teens and into college and uh, gets a lot of kids derailed. And, and where parents are, are just struggling to be able to guide them, especially once they get into college. And then fentanyl, as we know, has become a, a crisis. Many, many youth have lost their life with that. Uh, suicide, the topic of suicide and suicidal thoughts has, has uh, increased. Uh, the, the estimates are that more than about 3 million teens, that's 13 to about 18, struggle with serious suicidal thoughts every year. That's 3 million. There are about 3,000 attempts a day. Wow. Uh, to take their own life. And there's just, there's a lot coming that way. And then you add to that uh, the, the lack of time together, the average time spent between a parent and a child in intentional conversations, about 15 minutes a day. And, and they say that if, if you want to have a transmission of faith in actually a, a healthier home, it needs to be 90 minutes or more of intentionally engaging conversation between a parent and a child. And the average, you have 10 to 15 minutes. So that's a it's a crisis of influence there. Uh, so that, yeah, there are many, many things that the, the schedule, both parents working, tiredness, uh, the, the, the reality that phones, and that's a whole nother conversation there, the phones, right. the, the, the uh, social media, all that starts to pull parents in a, in a variety of different directions and kids. So th those are the main issues that I've been seeing. Yeah. Wow. A crisis of influence. I haven't heard that phrase. That's powerful. I really do believe that we have that. And I love that metric that you provided of that we need 90 minutes a day. I mean, that's an investment. And we know parenting is an investment, but that just kind of brings it home. This is work. This is time, but it's worth it. Yeah. And we know that. Oh, yeah. Let's dive into this topic of mental health. I wonder if you could you know, just give us a sense of what should a mentally healthy home look like? What kind of things are we looking for and striving for? Yeah, that's the that's a million dollar question, right? We Over time, uh, as I look at homes that are truly mentally healthy, and these are five dimensions that we'll be talking about here in a moment. When we see a mentally healthy home, they, they are balanced. They uh, they learn that they're, they're serving one another. There's a there's room for life giving reproof within that home. There's no fear of conflict. There's an entering of conflict where it's it's a, it's a healthy thing. It's not avoiding it. It's a place where there are goals. There are there, there's there's structure, but there's warmth and there's attunement and there's there's time spent where people care about each other 
and in that they see boundaries and limits as loving. That's where that's where it begins. And a lot of a lot of that is making choices with a purpose in mind. And you guys call this strategic families podcast. And it says that you're you're being strategic on what you're building in your child. You're growing as a parent and you're building in your child. It's a bi-directional transformation that begins to create a mentally healthy home. Now I'm not saying a perfect home. I'm saying a home that has mental health and is aware of the dimensions that influence what mental health is. It's a life-giving culture. Right. I love that word, life-giving. It's got such great connotations. That's what we're looking for. And I like the clarification there too. We're not talking about perfect homes because I think that can be a temptation for some of us to say like, well, we can't be perfect. Yeah. We know no family is perfect. We've all got work to do. But those five, yes, I want to dive into those. So before we get into some of those details, I think it would be helpful for our listeners to understand the nature of some of the problems that we're facing. And you've already referred to some of those stats, which are just kind of shocking. So what do the numbers tell us right now about the state of mental health within our homes? Well, there's so many stats out there now that we could we could spend some time on this. I'll give some highlights on some of them. Uh, they say that nine out of 10 girls are dissatisfied with their body now. Um, the most the, the social platform that is most damaging to kids' mental health are Instagram and TikTok. Right. And that's the, there, there are a lot of uh, uh, misperceptions, illusions that are brought through that that are very damaging to a developing child's mind. Right. Um, and then uh, a new term that's coming out is called bigorexia. And that's the, the fact that boys want to get as big as possible. Uh, they, they're obsessed with eating a certain foods, protein mm. shakes, and working out to be big in order to gain love. And there's a, a true obsession with that, and that's turning into a disorder. And then uh, drugs have uh, have gone up. Uh, they, they said in the last couple of years, there's been a t- 10% of people struggling with drugs have, have substantially gone up. And and then alcohol, same thing, more than 10% have increased their intake of that within teens and then adults too. And then if you look at uh, anxiety and depression, those have, have all exponentially gone up. And actually, just to give you some, some uh, feel to this, it says that nearly half of young people with mental health concern, concerns report a significant negative impact just on their overall functioning. And then uh, one in five young people report that the pandemic had a significant negative impact on their overall mental health. We know that throughout the pandemic, things shifted culturally. And in that, people's mental health uh, shifted because a lot of things came into question during that time. Our freedoms and other things that left people very anxious. And now we have uh, the war going on on the other side, and kids don't understand that. And they start to ask, is that going to come this way? Is this World War III is at the end of the world. There are a lot of unknowns that have been opened up. And uh, within uh, adolescence, they said that one in six have experienced a major depressive episode. That was in 2020. One in six adolescents experienced that. And uh, ages 18 to 25, one in three experienced some, t- some type of symptom related to mental illness. One in three of that's the 18 to 24 range. There's a lot of hopelessness with 1824, seeing the inflation go up and a lot of other things uh, creating complications for them as they try to go into the workforce and pursue their dreams. So there, there are a lot of momentums happening, but we know with Easter coming up and and, and the faith we've got, we have a counter momentum that's uh, steadfast, in, in, immovable. And as parents, we can bring that into our homes. As all kinds of momentums come into our home, come at us, that's a word I love. There's momentum that comes, but I get to choose in my home what momentum we're going to have. And I get to own that. I'm invited into that. And I get to to have the counter momentums. And the biggest one is, do I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again and that I have eternal life? And I can bring that into my home and bring a, create a life-giving culture that that is, is uh, maybe countercultural in many places, but then brings a new momentum wherever we go, grocery store, wherever we're at, we're bringing life because there's life in our home. 
Yes. Wow. So important to be grounded in that truth with all the craziness going around. We can be assured that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That changes everything about how we see the world. I love that concept of counter momentum. I'm going to use that with my kids. <laughs> I'll give you credit. <laughs> but at the dinner table, I'm going to say, hey, guys, we need some counter momentum. That's what Dr. Danny Huerta says. That's fantastic. I love that. In sports, do they like sports? Do your kids love sports? Yeah, I've used that. You know, you hear a lot of a lot of uh, newscasts say, "Man, momentum has shifted in the game," and and sometimes they'll say, "Man, someone needs to call timeout." Is the momentum's totally on the other team? So yep. we need to see that in our home. We say, "Hey, I need to call timeout, guys. Yes. Our momentum said <laughs> the wrong direction. We need to we need to regain the momentum we're wanting here in this house." Yes, and so let's call timeout and let's do it. So, yes. yes, yes, I love that, and I also love how you focused on like. We're invited to do that, and we have a choice. We can make that happen in our homes. We, we can't make everything happen, but we can have influence on the way we have conversations, the kind of things we talk about, the kind of things we let into our homes or not, you know, as the case may be. Yeah, great word. Thank you for that. Okay, so one of the things I know you like to talk about is, is the idea of soul care. Mm. I wonder if you can, first of all, tell us what – soul care is and why it's important. Can you give us an idea of what that looks like within a home? Well, if you look at David, he talked to his soul. I love that. He had mm. conversation with his own soul. He talked, he actually asked a question that, you know, are you good in there? Right. Is, is, is my soul good? Am I truly okay inside? And uh, in talking, I, I love to uh, talk about the idea that God is wanting to speak it, speak inside into our soul. He doesn't get tricked by our behaviors or the external. He wants to have the soul conversation. And so sometimes the way I, I, I look at it in the morning, I go, you know, my, is my heart ready to be in step? My soul, is it ready to be in step with that invitation that God's given my soul to do what I need to do? And it, it's, it's being in conversation with that deepest part of yourself. And that takes you pausing and thinking about it and really taking the time to be self-reflective and self-aware of what is really, really happening inside. And that, that requires prayer. That requires reading God's scripture and letting it penetrate into your soul. It requires a humble heart. What I picture is right now is springtime happening. The word humility came from the word, comes from the word humus. Humus allows the penetration of nutrients and water to come into the soil so that the roots can grow deeply. And is my heart in a humble place so that it can receive the nutrients that God is wanting to give me as I unwrap a brand new day and my soul experiences what God is wanting me to do? Am I starting the day off with a humble heart that is ready to receive that, whether I perceive it to be good or bad. Am I ready to be formed and shaped right. by that and truly see life as a gift? And if my soul begins there, then the rest of me, my beliefs, my thoughts, my emotions, my behaviors follow what is happening truly in my soul. That's great. I love that you reminded us this idea of soul care. You know, David says, why are you downcast? Oh, my soul. He does talk to his soul. This is a scriptural idea that we would care about how our souls are oriented towards God. I love that. I love that, you know, starting off the day, being ready to receive all that God wants to do in us and through us. That's fantastic. Okay. So you mentioned five areas of health. I wanted to dive into those a little bit because I think, you know, they're each so important in their own way. Could you tell us what those five areas are and how we can begin as parents to cultivate those in our homes? Yeah, first, I want to just share with everyone joining us in this conversation, Graham, that behaviors are where we, we tend to live. And there are a lot of illusions in that behavioral place. I picture a magician. They can mess with our brain so easily, but our mind begins to figure it out. And life is filled with illusions. It's like one giant magic trick, right? And we're getting duped to think that we're worth less. We're God saying, wait, where'd you get that? Who voted on that? I already voted. I'm the biggest vote. And I told you you're my masterpiece, right? Where in the world did you get that? So we're filled with these illusions. We have to begin with, you know, what, where, where is truth and in behaviors knowing that we can't, we can't read one another and spend time just on behaviors. And many times as parents, 
We're just reacting to behaviors with our kids. Right. Mental health is about going deeper. So you're going, the first one I love to talk about is emotions, that this emotional world comes right bef before behavior. What's happening in your emotions? And I'll ask my kids, what, when did you feel frustrated today? When did you feel a sense of loneliness? When did you feel sad? It's not, did you? It's when did you feel that? Because we do feel those things. It's not bad. Emotions are simply giving us a feeling about what we thought or read or perceived in the moment. So what's going on in your emotions? What has felt uh, real negative? What has felt positive? We have positive emotions, negative emotions. Uh, is sadness positive or negative? You know, it's good to ask kids. Sadness could actually be a real good thing. It gives you memory to, to some good things you loved, right? So you help your kids begin to determine what's positive, negative in those emotions in that we enter a room, every room with a negative or positive type of evaluation and why. Ask that question. So the next one is thoughts. What is happening in your thought bubbles? And I'll ask my kids, I'll say, hey, I bet you've got like 10 thought bubbles there. And I'd love for at least one of those to squeeze out into a talk bubble. You know, <laughs> I've got 10 there. Just let me in. I'd love to be in there. You know? And so I'll look, at, I'll look them in the eyes and I'll say, I love you. I would give my life for you. And I hope you know that. Tell me, tell me one of your thought bubbles. I'd love to hear that because I can see in your behavior. I've seen this. There's, there's a little bit of, uh, you, you seem sad to me. You're thinking about something. I'd love to be able to see what's going on there. So I'll ask about thought bubbles. Sometimes when we're having fun, I'll go, Hey, can you give me some of those fun thought bubbles? I just want to, I want to share in the funness with you. Right. And so we talk about our thought worlds, uh, even when we're driving, sometimes I'll say, okay, thought bubble time. Let's, but each one's going to throw out a thought bubble. Let's, let's, let's throw it out. And then the next one is the physical, the physical realm. Are, are you sleeping? Well, how long did, did you wake up a lot last night? Are your kids having a consistent sleep time? If they go to sleep past 12, there's a higher likelihood that they'll struggle, struggle with mental health because before 12, before midnight is when you're having your repair in your brain. And uh, otherwise your, your brain is on borrowed resources past midnight and it can create all kinds of havoc there. And then are you eating well? What we eat affects our mental health. And that's so true. Are you exercising? Exercising creates new proteins for the for new neurons to, to be created it's so good for the brain the organ of the brain to have good sustained exercise that's very important uh, being active physically are you is there touch is there affection in your home that that creates that mental health that physicality that is so important in a home and, and, and many times people are too busy to hug or just hold one another and Remember when my daughter said one time, she said, Dad, can we do 60 seconds where you just hold me for 60 seconds and we can just be together? And I said, That's yeah, awesome. let's do that. So then I'd lay there and then I'd be almost done. And then she'd go, no, 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 no. Can we do 160 seconds, 100 points, <laughs> 180, 180 seconds? So she started to count as she got older. That's awesome. And then it reminded me of that physicality that I so longed for with, with Jesus, right? right? Where I'd go, hey, can you hold me? I'd love right, to be held right. too. And it just reminds me of that, gives that great picture. And then the fourth one, Graham, is, is uh, that relational, the relational dynamics. What are those like in our home? Are we spending time together? Where are we investing our time? What friendships are we involving in? Who gets a vote in saying who, if I, if I have worth or not? Who gets a vote to say if I'm good at something or not? And why did they get that? Just the relational aspect of our lives. And are we actually spending time together? And then the last one is the most important one, foundation, and that's spiritual. Over and over again, research shows that a family that consistently prays, has mealtimes together, reads scripture together, is, is much more mentally healthy down the road. And that is within a context of a warm environment, a loving environment where you are, you're allowed to fail. And in that you have right. grace. And you're able to pray for one another. So the spiritual side is, is also an important dimension. If you have all those five areas, emotions, thoughts, physical, relational, and spiritual, that creates a template for a mentally healthy home. Fantastic. What a great framework. What a life-giving challenge to be able to help cultivate all those things in our homes. And we know it's not going to be easy. It is work, no. but it's worth it. Okay, so 
I think you touched on this a little bit. This is uh, selfishly, this is a question for me a little bit. And you talked about how sometimes we focus on the behavior. It's so easy to focus on the behavior. Sometimes we just want it to stop, you know, like we, we hear crying and it's just like, I want the crying to stop. That's all I want, you know, in my flesh, that's all I want. But it's an indication of something deeper, you know, and that's kind of what you're getting at when you talk about mental health. How do we get into our kids mind, so to speak, just to find out in their hearts, really to find out what's really going on, because sometimes you're going to get a wall. You know, I don't want to mm. talk about it. I, I'm just I just want to be sad. And I, I think sometimes I push too hard, you know, and <laughs> sometimes I need to back off. So I don't can, yeah. can you give us like a framework, some helpful tips, because we do want to know, at least we should. We should want to know what's going on in our kids hearts, it's not just about behavior, it's what's going on in their hearts. So help me out. Yeah, so you just come with a mental crowbar, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, it's it's good to make intentional side to side time, and naturally it will come once a child feels the calmness of it. So here's the, here's the deal: if we ourselves as parents are regulated, that means our emotions we're not in a stress mode, but we're calm. It begins to create a calmness, a mirroring of that in our child. Right. But it takes us being present. So that means. You can't rush it. You can't just go, come on, <laughs> you got to tell me what's in your on your mind. But if yes. you come in and you go, I value you tremendously. And I see you're wrestling with some big things. I, I wish I could, I could, you know, at least have a glimpse into that, into the thought bubbles that seem to be wrestling with you. Hey, we're going to take a walk. I just want to be with you. No pressure to do it. Right. Just, I'm just here. I want you to know that, that I'm, I'm here with you. And you just take a walk. Sometimes it's throwing a football together. Sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's just being able to uh, be present with one another. What I recommend parents do is if your child loves to shoot baskets, go out and say, hey, let, you know, let's go shoot baskets. Or you throw the Frisbee. Something that has some type of rhythm and it begins to calm that alarm system that they have going on. Sure. It calms it down and the guard comes down. You say, hey, again, let me know if, if there's anything you want to share that I could just come alongside you on. Yeah. And uh, sometimes ice cream is a good one, right? You can mm, just go up ice cream sure. together. Hey, let's go get a let's go get a, a milkshake or a root beer float. And uh, this is this is thought bubble time. And so I, I I love being able to I you know celebrate the fact that I get to have some time in there. So maybe this is like a little cel- thought bubble celebration we're having together. And uh, I'll share some of mine, and and uh, we can share with each other, no pressure. Right. And as you do that, your calmness is going to create the environment for them to be able to be want to be open with you. Right. Uh, that makes perfect sense. I had a friend years ago. I've got three daughters, and he has four daughters, and they were older. And I said, "Give me some wisdom, man. I got three daughters. You know what? <laughs> what's your advice?" And he goes, "Eat a lot of pizza." And I'm like. You love pizza. What's that all about? And he said he would take his daughters out one on one for pizza. And it's exactly what you're saying. I mean, you're showing you referred to this earlier, but you're showing that you care. Hey, I love you. I want to help. I'm here. I'm not trying to force this or pressure you, but I want you to know I care. And even just spending the time and being there, that ministry of presence, I think, goes such a long way. So, um, yeah, no, that's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that tip. All right. I'm going to. I'm going to try all this stuff out. I feel like I need to be more patient with it. And, you know, you can't force it. I try so hard to just fix things sometimes. And we know human hearts don't work like that. So great encouragement. Thank you for that. You know, what's awesome, Graham, is sometimes with daughters is just just being affectionate. One thing that I love to do with my daughter from a word affection side is I, I use a chalk marker and I draw on her mirror and I'll draw truths where she's going to see herself. And we have found things to do together all. And, and that's our biggest conversations are then we will bake something together or we made whip body soap the other day. I said, Hey, can you teach me how to do that body soap stuff? Can we get a recipe you order stuff? I, I just want, you are my teacher. I just want to do it with you. And as we're hanging out, I'll just ask some questions nonchalantly. That's our friendship's going, you know, sure. and we're just having this conversation where she's, she's very open. It's not me sitting down and asking her, it's a side by side, but it's an activity she likes to do and showing that interest. So yep. you as, as, as dads know those different interests your daughters have. So, yeah, that's great. You know what? That reminds me of Deuteronomy where it says, you know, as you sit and as you lie down, as you walk, you know, as you walk about the way, that's the kind of thing it's talking about. As you make soap together, as you wash dishes together, as you, you know, clean the house together, like 
yeah, I mean, we can be effective parents and influential parents and show that we love them and care and teach them the truth of God during those mundane things. So I love it. I love it. All right. Next topic, technology, such a huge topic. We could do a whole podcast. I mean, you could have not just one episode, you could do a whole podcast. On, there probably are podcasts on this. So obviously we can't cover everything, but it's such an important topic. Just being armchair psychologist, I imagine that some of our mental health issues are at least correlated, maybe not caused. I don't know, but this is where you come in. Give us some tips on technology, screens, phones, TV, computers, all this. How does this tie into mental health? What are some guardrails we need to put up in our homes? What are your thoughts on all that? Wow, there's so much. Uh, Within social media, we truly know for a fact that it's addictive and that it's damaging. It's as addictive as as some of the drugs uh, out there, cocaine. Uh, They said that we get as much dopamine hit from social media as sex. And so it's created an addiction to be on it all the time. And so that it, then we take balance off, right? And, and then right. there are messages that come through that that are not necessarily really true at all. And, and it begins to create a crisis of identity for many people, many of the, especially the youth. Uh, social media is, a, is, a, is an issue. Video games for guys, they, they get a false sense of power and, and, and conquering and they, they end up going into this other world for hours and hours and leave their real life off to the side. And we're having a crisis of guys not growing up uh, because they're in this uh, other, other world of video games. And so they have a hard time with those limits. The brain wasn't designed to be able to create boundaries on such, such big uh, dopamine hits like we're, we're creating for them. And then they were designed to become addictive to people so that they come, they come back over and over again. And then we've got, a lot of messages coming through movies, through stream TV, and parents are trying to figure out where do I put boundaries. Now we've got movies on Disney Plus, we've got movies on Netflix, we've got movies out wherever, and, and Paramount, everybody's coming out with movies, and then you've got TV show series, and then you've got YouTube shorts, and YouTube this, and Instagram shorts, and TikTok. I mean, so for parents, just influences are coming from all over, and the messages aren't necessarily very positive or, or definitely redeeming from a biblical worldview right and so we also have if i say another crisis be a worldview crisis and a recent poll showed that millennial parents about two percent have a biblical worldview and these are parents with children 13 or younger that's came that came from dr george barna uh with the millennial parents and so that's that next generation two percent hold a true biblical worldview so you have that these people are guiding kids into a space that has so many different worldviews that that are trying to influence the kids and shape their lives. It's it's a it's a tough place and parents need to be intentionally engaged on what boundaries they're going to have, when they're going to have the phone and why. In our home, uh, our kids had contracts uh, before they had a phone at 16. And uh, we talked about, I mean, you have a driver's license, right? Why in our home, you're going to have a contract where you get that. And there's a lot of responsibility, a lot of trust that has to be built in order for you to have this, this, this device. And they don't, neither one has social media accounts. Uh, and uh, one of the, the tasks I put them on is look around and see the impact it's having on your friends first as they're allowed to do that. And then give me a case as to the why. Why as a parent that loves you so much, why would I say yes to that? If you can make a compelling case, I'll think about it. But for now, build trust. I need to see that you do that because I know it's important to you and, and I'm open to having the conversation, but I don't see, I, I'm not going to be part of your self-destruction. I wouldn't mm, do that. To right. I want to be a part of your building and life giving. And if you say yes to your phone and technology and video games, you're going to say no to drumming and basketball and other things you love to do. And, uh, and so I, I got to help you navigate that. So it takes intentionality, conversations, clear boundaries, clear limits, and sometimes tough conversations. Wow. I got to get a hold of that contract you talked about. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> Put it in writing and make, it, make your expectations clear. Yeah. I love it. Wow. Such wisdom. You know, we're talking about all these ways to be healthy. In some cases, you know, we may have folks listening who there is an issue. There's an ongoing source of, of stress regarding mental illness. I just wonder, you know, every case is different. So there's no one size fits all approach, I'm sure. Is there some encouragement? Are there some tips and approach that you can offer to some families who may be struggling with a mental illness in their home? 
Mental illness is tough because it's a lot of times the mental, a person looks perfectly fine, normal on the outside. So it's not like you have a, a missing arm or a cut or, you know, crutches or anything. You, you look normal, you look normally functioning and right. anxiety is, can be crippling, depression, all that. What you want to do is make sure you get with a, with a counselor that gives a clear treatment plan of what you guys are going to do. Uh, usually when, when uh, families come into my office, I tell them, Hey, the sooner you fire me, the better it is. That's that. I, I don't want you to just park here. This is right. we're going on a journey of discovery, but then a plan and tools for you to, to, to really be able to manage the mental illness as it shows up and uh, know that for a lot of kids, mental illness shows up 13 years. That's when it's exposed. It comes out, stress hits, and all of a sudden you see something you hadn't seen before. And that's when mental illness starts to show itself. Right. And uh, and as you see those signs that are pretty big, maybe a huge shift in interest, a loss of interest, uh, maybe it's panic, social panic, social anxiety, not wanting to be around people, a big shift in the person. That's a time to get an evaluation if they, if they don't already have a diagnosis. If they do have a diagnosis, then you come alongside of them and begin to come together with a plan that, that this is something we're going to deal with together. You don't, you're right. not alone on doing this. Right. Family are going to pray for you. We're going to be right there. Whenever I need to put everything down and just listen, I'm going to do that. We're going to navigate this together to bring health to a place where there's illness. Right. That's so good. I love that idea of doing it together. That's one of the powerful things about families. That's fantastic. Coming to the end of our time here, but I want to sort of put an exclamation point on this, you know, on, on this podcast, you know, we love talking about having health within our families, but we also love talking about what God wants to do through our families to advance his kingdom. What can happen if we truly do get a hold of this by God's grace, can't do this in our own strength, but by his grace, if we have mentally healthy homes, what is the effect? I mean, you could talk to both sides of it. What's the effect if we don't really cultivate this? And then what is the effect if we do? What's going to happen over time, if you don't tend to it, it's kind of like an accidental flower in your garden. There's going to be no substantial growth to it. Uh, most likely your kids go do, they, they have success and all that, but it leaves, it leaves a family pretty empty when you're not investing in the invitation of being able to, to dig into that relationship opportunity, that invitation we've got. And mental health is being challenged every day. And right now, uh, most people have probably heard we are in a mental health crisis and we truly are. And many counselors have very long waiting lists of people waiting to get in because they're struggling with their mental health. So as families, if we don't take it seriously, we could be one of those families because you neglected it. Just like if you neglect your body and you don't work out, all of a sudden you may have a crisis on your hands. This is uh, the, the opportunity of being mentally healthy is, is only something that's going to give you satisfaction down the road. The investment is well worth it. Uh, you create a, a culture in your home uh, where, where people can fail, people can grow. It's very connected. It's a loving environment. It's one that you enjoy being a part of. But it does take investment, sacrifice, time. And uh, that's something that you have to, if you don't want to do that, you have to figure out why. And maybe there's some people, some friends, other people that can maybe speak into your life. I like to ask some of my friends, hey, where are my blind spots? Where am I not listening well? And I want to listen. I want to make sure I'm listening well. Please tell me where those are at. And so it begins with us as parents being healthy individually so we can be healthy in our marriage and enjoy that beauty of marriage. And out of that, we can create a good, healthy home that can deal with all the the, the imperfections that are going to spill out with our differences and, and with the reality of what the impact of life on us. One thing I want to, I want to say when, if there is mental illness in your home, make sure you're not ignoring the kids that are, that, that are healthy. Many times our focus goes into that one child that's struggling with mental illness and we're worried and all that. Make sure you're taking time for each one. And it's about mental health for the whole home. And you're doing it together. You're doing the, the mental illness together as far as supporting the other child. Uh, we have a tendency to be off balance in that as well. Sometimes we just look at the crisis and respond to that. So keep that in mind. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I love what you shared about the humility that we need to have. It's man, humility goes such a long way to ask other people what our blind spots are. I mean, we've sort of got a relationship like that with my wife's parents, and it's just great to say, you know, hey 
what do you guys see? Where do we need to, what do we need to work on as parents? And it's okay. We can handle it. You know, we know we're not perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's so helpful. Last couple of questions here. What tools and resources would you direct people to, would you recommend so that they could take, you know, steps towards better mental health in their homes? Well, one, I know we were talking about being life-giving outside of our home. One resource you could be a part of is called that, uh, Raising Highly Capable Kids. And people can go to resilientkids.com. And that's with Z's in there, resilientkids.com. And that one, uh, you can be trained to provide 13-week parenting programs for these parents that uh, may be struggling or in Title I schools and, and then provide graduations for them. It, right now, we have that, that program in 34 states. More than 32,000 parents have gone through it. We have 6,000 facilitators. We encourage parents that are ready. If, they're, if their home's going well and they, they want it, they're, they're there to serve. They're at a place where they can. Man, if you can do that, go uh, be trained. Bring it to your community. Create an army of, of people within the church that can go outside of their home and serve other families. Uh, as far as for your own uh, personal home, where I would start is focusonthefamily.com slash parenting, focusonthefamily.com slash parenting. We have lots of articles. We're having th at least three new content pieces a day, a lot of videos, and uh, you can take the seven traits of effective parenting assessment to see where you're at as a parent is a good starting point. And then I wrote a book called Seven Traits of Effective Parenting, and you can go into those well-researched that was part of my dissertation or the, the dissertation on that. And then we have personality differences in there as well. Then we have live it challenges. If you go to bringyourbible.org, you can be part of a movement that we're creating through Focus on the Family, where we ask, we ask kids all around the country at over 500, 590,000 households that uh, where kids took their Bible to school on that day in October. And then that's a starting point to engage with God's word together. And then we have live it challenges monthly. So sign up for a Live It Challenge, and in that, you can get uh, reminders every month of some challenges you can take on as a family. So that's just a few examples. We have a book that came out on worldview differences, and each character is a worldview, and that's Captain Absolutely. And at the end, it gives you content on talking about how those worldviews play out. So remember, as parents, you get to be the most influential uh, person in that child's life, not only in their mental health, but their spiritual development. What an invitation it is. Yes. What an invitation. And what an honor. That's excellent. Thank you for all those resources. I will put those in the show notes so people don't have to take notes while they're listening to this, but focus on the family.com slash parenting. I think you said. That's right. Yeah. And Graham, one other one is we have a counseling line where you can talk to a counselor for free. 1-800, the letter A and the word family. If there is a struggle with mental health in your home, you can speak with one of those. That's absolutely free. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, Dr. Huerta, thank you so much for your time and thank you for your ministry at Focus on the Family and all that Focus on the Family does to shore up the family unit and help us be on mission for the Lord. What a privilege it is to talk to you and, and get all this wisdom from you. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Graham. Appreciate it. Dr. Huerta, thank you so much for taking the time to share your passion and all of this great wisdom with us today. There's so much gold we can take from what you've shared with us. And thank you for the awesome work you do for the kingdom through families that focus on the family. All right, parents, let's do it. You know, I think sometimes it just starts with us caring about what's going on in our kids' hearts and minds. Children are such a blessing from the Lord. Let's be intentional and strategic by being sensitive to the emotions they're showing. And when we do that, We'll have opportunities to speak peace and joy and life into their hearts and show them just how amazing and kind our Heavenly Father is to His children. Well, check us out on strategicfamilies.com. As always, we would love to hear from you on how you're building a strategic family that honors Christ. All right, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.